Hello friends, welcome back to Discovering Revelations. Are you ready for another quiz from our topic last time? Pull out a piece of paper and a pen, and we're going to go through the quiz for Revelations Rapture. Question number one is a yes or no. Will Jesus' feet touch the earth when he comes back the second time? Will Jesus' feet touch the earth when he comes back the second time? Yes or no? Question two is a true or false. When Jesus comes again, it will be a secret event. Is that true or false? When Jesus comes again, it will be a secret event. Question three is a question. How many eyes will see Jesus when he comes back the second time? How many eyes will see Jesus when he comes back the second time? Question number four is a true or false. At the second advent of Christ, the righteous dead will be resurrected. Is that true or false? At the second advent of Christ, the righteous dead will be resurrected. And then number five is a review. List one of the five facts we discovered from the Bible that describe the second advent of Christ. If you were taking notes from our last study, well, you can even look back at your notes. It's okay. And list one. We found five of the five facts we discovered from the Bible that describe the second advent of Christ. Are you ready to check your answers? Question number one, yes or no. Will Jesus' feet touch the earth when he comes back the second time? What's the answer? The answer is no. We go up to meet him in the air. Question two, when Jesus comes again, it will be a secret event. What's the answer? The answer is false. No secret when Christ comes back. Question three, how many eyes will see Jesus when he comes back the second time? The answer is all eyes or every eye, whichever one you put, all eyes, every eye. Question four, at the second advent of Christ, the righteous dead will be resurrected. Is that true or false? The answer is true. And number five, list one of the five facts we discovered from the Bible that describe the second advent of Christ. What were those five facts? Number one, it will be literal. Number two, visible. Number three, audible. Number five, climactic. Number Number four, climactic. Number five, glorious. So if you got one of those, well, then you ace the quiz if you got all the others correct. If you have questions, you can write to us. Our Gmail account is discoveringrevelation at gmail.com. You can send us a question on that email, discoveringrevelation at gmail.com. Now today in our study, we're going to be looking at the millennium or the thousand years. And your lesson for this is number 12. And you can download the lesson from revelationsofprophecy.com. The lesson is thousand years of peace. There is our website. And you can also find at least some of the videos there from what we have looked at from previous studies. You can also go to our Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.com, and you can do the lessons online. <clears throat> now, our next study, our next lesson will be Survival Keys for Revelations End Time. And certainly that ought to be a good topic for the, the era we're living in now with all the concern about disease. Survival Keys for Revelations End Time. Then, Tuesday, we'll be studying Revelation's gateway to a new life. <coughs> Excuse me. How to begin a new life. If you ever wished you could bury the past and start all over, we'll find out how to do that on Tuesday. Then, Wednesday is one of probably one of the most important topics in our entire series. The seal of God and the mark of the beast. We've already studied about the beast. We found out what the number of the beast is, but we still haven't identified the mark of the beast. We'll do that on Wednesday. Now today, we're going to 
sing our theme song before we begin our study. And we invite you to sing along with us right where you are in your home. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We invite you to bow your head with us again as we pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention tonight to Revelation 20, the millennium, we pray that you would teach us the truth about end time, all the various events. We ask as we study that we might have your Holy Spirit as our teacher. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight, our topic is Revelation's millennium, when the devil goes on vacation. Let me ask you, how many of you like vacations? <laughs> the more the better, right? Vacations always come so seldom and they're always over too quickly. But did you know the Bible predicts a time when the devil himself will go on vacation, not just for a weekend, but for a thousand years. And surprisingly, the devil does not want a vacation. He's going to have to be forced into this vacation. We're going to read about the devil's vacation in Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. We're going to see the binding of the devil. I hope you did your homework reading. You should have read Revelation 20. We're going to study the whole chapter today. Revelation 20, beginning with verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, John says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him, how long? A thousand years. This thousand year period is sometimes referred to as the millennium. The word millennium actually comes from two Latin words, mille meaning thousand, and annum meaning years. And we want to begin our study of the millennium or the thousand years with this question. When will this thousand year vacation of the devil begin? To answer that, we're going to go to the words of Jesus found in John 5, verses 28 and 9. If you're taking notes today, John 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Here Jesus outlines two separate general resurrections. We're not talking about any special resurrections here. We're talking about the general resurrections. Resurrection of life, resurrection of damnation. Apparently the resurrection of life would be for the righteous. If you die, you want to be in that resurrection. And then the resurrection of damnation would be for the wicked. Two separate general resurrections. Apparently the saved and the lost do not come up in the same resurrections. Resurrection of life would be for the righteous. Resurrection of damnation would be for the wicked. Which brings us then to the question, when do these two resurrections take place? And which one comes first? To answer that, we're going back to Revelation. Revelation 20, verse 6 this time. Revelation 20, verse 6, the Bible says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the which? The first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Where will the saints reign with Christ for a thousand years? We're going to answer that in just a moment. But notice the blessed and the holy come up in this first resurrection. No wicked person has any part in that first resurrection. Since there's a first, that implies there must be a 
Second, we're looking at the first one. That would be for the blessed, for the holy. Jesus called that resurrection the resurrection of life. That's the one you want to be in if you die. No wicked person is going to have any part in that first resurrection. Let's add another text for this point. We're reading from Revelation 20, verse 4 now. Revelation 20, verse 4 says, John says, I, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. This is the saints in heaven. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. I might mention these are not disembodied souls or ghosts. These are actual people that have been resurrected. They're there in heaven. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Where do they reign? We'll answer that in just a moment. But it says they lived. In the original language, it means they came to life. That word lived means they came to life or they were resurrected. And then they reign with Christ for a thousand years. So we can clearly see then that the thousand year period begins at the resurrection of the righteous. They lived, they came to life, they were resurrected, and then they reign with Christ for a thousand years. All of the righteous that are in the graves are resurrected in the first resurrection. Well, that would leave us with the question, what about those that don't come up in the first resurrection? What about the rest of the dead? Let's read now Revelation 20, verse 5. Revelation 20, verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead, who would that be? Since all the righteous came up in the first resurrection, the rest of the dead would have to be the wicked. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. They will live again, but not until the end of the thousand years. And Jesus referred to that resurrection as the resurrection of damnation. And I might mention, if you're following in your Bible, the last sentence of verse 5, Revelation 20, verse 5, actually belongs to verse 6. The rest of the dead, verse 5 says, live not again until the thousand years were finished. So do you have the picture now? We have two rep resurrections separated by a thousand year period. We have the first resurrection at the beginning of the thousand years. Jesus called that one the resurrection of life. And then we have the second resurrection at the end of the thousand years, which Jesus called the resurrection of damnation. Two resurrections separated by a thousand year period. Notice again, Revelation 20 verse 5, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. They shall reign with him a thousand years. You see that? And then verse 6, said, that was verse 6 rather, verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished or until they were ended. Two resurrections separated by a thousand year period. Which brings us now to this question, when does the first resurrection take place, which begins the thousand year period? To answer that, we're going to go to Paul's writings, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. You can add that to your notes today. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Again, there's another text showing us that the resurrection of life, that's the first resurrection. So the resurrection of life takes place when Jesus comes back. That's when the thousand years begins. When Christ returns, there will actually be four groups of people for him to deal with. And if you're, you're taking notes, you can mark down these four groups. There will be the righteous dead, the righteous living, the wicked dead, and the wicked living. Every person that's ever lived or died falls into one of these four groups. Number one, the righteous dead. Number two, the righteous living. Number three, the wicked dead. Number four, the wicked living. We want to find out today what happens to each of these four groups when Jesus comes back. Let's start with that first group, 
the righteous dead. What happens to them when Jesus comes back? Well, we already read it. They are resurrected. They come forth with immortality, immortal youth. They might have gone into the grave looking like old men and women. But when they come out of the grave, they don't look like old men and women. They're going to look like young people for all eternity. They have immortal bodies, immortal youth. The righteous dead when they are resurrected. They're resurrected with perfect bodies. Well, what about the righteous that are living? What happens to them when Christ comes back? Let's read 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17 now for the answer. <clears throat> the Bible says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, that's those resurrected, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Please notice the Bible says we're caught up how? We're caught up together. Those that were resurrected and those of us that are alive when Christ comes back, we're all caught up together. I had somebody tell me one time, Pastor, my daddy told me when he died, Honey, I'll be waiting for you at the pearly gate to welcome you to glory. I thought, huh, how can he do that? The only way our loved ones who have died could be, welcome, be there to welcome us at the pearly gates is if they run ahead of us on the road to glory. Because the Bible says we're all caught up how? We're caught up together. Those that are, that are resurrected, those of us that are living, we're all caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And the good news, we that are alive, we too shall be changed. The Bible tells us we're going to be changed in an instant. As fast as you can blink your eye. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. So we that are alive, we also will get glorified bodies, immortal youth. Every ache, every pain, every sign of aging is going to disappear in an instant. And all the righteous will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Well, then, after being caught up, raptured, because that's what rapture means, to be caught up, to meet the Lord in the air, where do the righteous go? Let's read our answer from Jesus. John 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. Where did he go? He went back to heaven to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, where is Jesus? He's up in heaven. Where I am, there ye may be also. So now we can answer the question, where will the righteous reign during the thousand years? The answer is they're going to reign in heaven. I know a lot of people think that the reign, the saints with the Lord, is going to be on the earth. The Bible doesn't teach that. The saints are going to reign up in heaven. That's where they're going to spend the thousand years. So we have found out what happens to the righteous when Christ comes back. The righteous dead are resurrected. The righteous living are changed. All the righteous are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, taken up to those mansions prepared for us. That leaves us now with two more groups, the wicked. Let's go to number three, the wicked dead. What happens to them when Christ comes back? Well, we read earlier from Revelation 20, verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So what happens to the wicked dead? Essentially, nothing happens to them. They don't roll over in their graves. They don't stir. Nothing. They go right on sleeping the sleep of death for another thousand years, waiting for their resurrection, which will take place at the end of the thousand years. That leaves us with one more group, and that's the wicked living. What happens to them when Jesus comes back? This is the most tragic picture, but the Bible shows it to us. We're going to read from 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. The Bible says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Here he is coming back, second time, in power and glory, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with 
everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the wicked that are alive when Christ comes back, they're going to be punished with destruction, the Bible tells us. They cannot live in the sight of a holy God. We'll add another text. Next chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, of course that's a symbol of all the wicked, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Sin cannot endure in the presence of a holy God. So when Christ comes back in power and glory, the wicked, they are cut down by the glory of his presence. So then, all the wicked that are living when Christ comes back, they are slain or killed by the brightness of Christ's coming. And I want to clarify, this is not hellfire. Hellfire, we will find out, actually burns at the end of the thousand years. The wicked are simply killed by the brightness of Christ's coming, and their dead bodies are left scattered all over the world. That leaves us with this question. Is there any chance of being saved after Jesus comes? The answer is no. The fact is, who would be left to save? All the righteous, where did they go? They all went to heaven. All the wicked, what's happened to them? They're all dead. So who would be left to save? This whole idea that is popular in some Christian circles, that we're going to have a thousand year millennium of peace on earth, where everyone gets a second chance to accept salvation, that's a pleasing delusion of the devil, to lead people to put off the decision for eternity. If you wait until Jesus comes to seek for salvation, it's too late. That's why the Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait until Christ comes back. Because then when he comes, he brings rewards for every person. The righteous, they're going up to meet the Lord in the air. The wicked, they will all be slain. So in review, at the second coming, Christ returns. The righteous dead are resurrected. The righteous living are changed in an instant. The righteous are all caught up together and taken to heaven. The wicked that are dead, they remain dead. And the wicked that are living when Christ comes back, they are slain. Which now brings us to the question, what is the condition of this earth during the thousand years? To answer that, we need to consider what happens to this earth when Jesus comes back. Let's review from Revelation 16, verse 18. We studied this the other night. Revelation 16, 18, the Bible says, And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. This is what happens when Christ comes. Verse 20 says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Can't find the Rocky Mountains, they're gone. Tell me. What will that earthquake do to every man-made structure? It's going to flatten every building, every bridge, everything built by man is going to be leveled, going to be destroyed by that tremendous earthquake. Can you imagine what this world is going to look like after Christ comes back? The scene of desolation and ruin caused by that earthquake, all the broken down buildings and structures and all the corpses of the lost scattered all over the world. What a picture. In fact, the Bible gives us a picture of this in Jeremiah 25, verse 33. You can add that to your notes today. Jeremiah 25, verse 33 says, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth, they shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. That's what this world is going to look like after Christ comes back. The wicked, their dead bodies are scattered all over the earth. And the Bible says they're not gathered, they're not buried. Why not? Why wouldn't somebody gather up the dead and bury them? Well, the fact is, who's left to do it? All the righteous, where did they go? They've all gone to heaven. The wicked, they're all dead. So there's nobody left to lament or to gather or to bury them. This earth will be one vast cemetery. 
during the thousand years, a scene of desolation and ruin. Let's notice Isaiah's description of the earth during this time. Isaiah 24, we will read verse 1, verse 3, and then verses 19 through 22. You can put all of that in your notes today. Isaiah 24, verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. That's what he does when he comes back. He takes away all the righteous, all the wicked are left dead. The Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Verse 3, the land shall be utterly emptied, and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. Where is everybody? All the righteous, gone to heaven. All the wicked, they're dead. And so Isaiah says the land is utterly emptied. Verses 19 through 22 says, The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is removed exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. There's that great earthquake. And shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. It shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. This would be the wicked. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the, in the where? In the pit. We read back there in Revelation 20 that the devil's locked up in a pit. These prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. And after many days shall they be visited. After how many days? After a thousand years. Let's go back to Jeremiah for his description. Jeremiah 4, 23 to 27. It's as if Jeremiah had an eyewitness view of what happened. Jeremiah 4, 23 through 27, he says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was out without form and void. What does that sound like? Almost sounds like Genesis 1, verse 2, where it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It's as if God returns this earth as it was in some degree to the chaotic condition it was before he created order out of it. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. There's that earthquake again, pictured. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. Where is everybody? All the righteous, gone to heaven. All the wicked, dead. So Jeremiah, looking at it, he says, There was no man. All the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities, how many? All the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by the, his fierce anger. See, the Lord has come back in this picture. And now Jeremiah is seeing all the ruin and desolation caused by that. And for thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Please notice the Bible tells us, Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Thousand year blackout. That's proof that no human is going to be living here on planet earth during the thousand years. This is not going to be a thousand years of peace when the, the saints reign on earth. Humans can't live in a thousand year blackout. Now, of course, the devil, he can live in the dark. He likes the dark. We'll find out what happens to him in a moment. But no human is going to be living here. This earth is going to be a scene of ruin and desolation from pole to pole for a thousand years. Now, my next question is this. Where will the devil be during the thousand-year period? Tell me, where would you put the devil, if you could, during the thousand years? <laughs> Put him right here in the mess that he's created. And that's exactly what God does. Let's go back now to Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3. And now the picture is going to come into clearer focus. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3, the Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. 
And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed how long? For a little season. So he's bound in the bottomless pit. Where's that? What's that? The word bottomless pit comes from the Greek word abusos, where we get our English word abyss from. It's a waste place, a desolate place. Tell me where in the universe do you suppose we would find a place of desolation, a place of ruin, where everything's broken down? Where would that be? Right here in this earth. This earth is the abusos. And that's why Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. If you looked at the Greek version of the Old Testament, you would see there the abusos, the bottomless pit, and the heavens, and they had no light. So the bottomless pit then refers to this earth in its desolate, broken down, chaotic condition during the thousand years. That's where the devil is bound. But you say he's bound with a great chain. What is that chain? Well, first of all, we know it's not a literal chain because the devil is a spiritual being, and you cannot bind a spiritual being with a literal chain. That would be like chaining the wind. You can't do that. What is the chain that binds the devil? It would have to be a chain of circumstances or a chain of events. What are those circumstances? What are the events? All the righteous, where are they? They've gone to heaven. All the wicked, what's happened to them? They're all dead. So what does the devil have to do? His hands are tied. It's a figure of speech. If I wanted to help you do something, but circumstances were preventing me, I might say, well, I'd like to help you, but my hands are tied. Not that my hands are literally tied, but it's a figure of speech indicating that circumstances are preventing me from assisting you. And so the chain of circumstances here that binds the devil is the fact that there's nobody left to tempt. I heard somebody say that I guess there's one church that teaches that the devil is already bound. They say he was bound back in 1914 or 1918 or something like that. Well, I tell you, if the devil is already bound today and the world is this bad, we'd better hope he doesn't get loose. <laughs> no, the devil's not bound. If he is bound, he's bound with a chain of rubber bands that stretches from here to Las Vegas and back. <laughs> and even if you could, listen, even if you could bind the devil in a literal pit with a literal chain, would that stop him from working? He's got a billion demons working for him. The only way you could truly bind the devil is if you take everybody away from him so that he has nobody to tempt. And that's exactly what God does for a thousand year period. All the righteous have been taken to heaven. All the wicked are dead. The devil is chained by circumstances. And incidentally, Probably God is going to force him to stay here on planet Earth. He's not going to be allowed to fly off through the universe and visit other worlds. He's going to be bound to this ruinous world for a thousand years. Which brings us to the question, what is the devil going to do on this Earth during the thousand years? He's bound here. What's he got to do? Well, I guess he has nothing to do but think. No doubt he'll think back over the centuries, the millennium, as he's rebelled against God. He has been forced again and again to admit defeat. The devil is a true suicide warrior. He just doesn't give, give up fighting. And no doubt he'll look forward to the future. He knows what the Bible says is going to happen to him. A fire is going to come right out of the devil, Ezekiel 28 tells us, and that fire is going to turn the devil to ashes. The devil knows what this book says. <laughs> now, of course, he doesn't want you to know. He'll do everything he can to keep you away from studying God's Word or from tuning into a Discovering Revelations program. I don't know if you've had any trouble arranging your schedule to tune in. 
The devil does not want people to know the Word of God, to study the Word of God. He knows the Bible, but he doesn't want you to know it. And no doubt, during the thousand years, the devil, he will stumble around in the darkness looking at the corpses of the lost. Will he see you here in this desolate earth? I hope not. I can imagine the devil as he's walking around in the darkness, he can see in the dark, looking at the corpses of the lost. He comes upon the carcass of a man he remembers well. He remembers exactly how he worked in that man's life. As he looks at that man, he sees frozen on that man's face an expression of anguish. I can imagine that this man had a Christian wife. And let's imagine that they had three little girls. And every week the wife would go to church with the three little girls and she would urge her husband to surrender his life to Jesus and be a Christian. But he thought, you know, religion, that's for women. I don't, I'm busy, I have business, I'm making money, I'm providing for my family. So he said, well, maybe sometime. And I can imagine this man perhaps would hear his little girls sometimes at night praying for their daddy that one day he would give his heart to Jesus and join the family, and go to church. And he thought to himself, well, maybe, yeah, maybe someday I'll join the family. But he kept putting it off, procrastinating. And then one day the ground began shaking beneath his feet, the earthquake. He looked up, and he saw that spot of glory as Jesus was drawing close to the earth, and he was not ready. And so that man, with all the other wicked, he was cut down by the glory of the, of, of the Lord. And there he is, his body laying there, faced with an expression of anguish. And as the devil looks at that man, I can just imagine that a hideous smile spreads over the devil's face. He knows that never again will that man have another chance of being saved. Think about it, friend. Could that be you? If there is some commitment you know you need to make, some decision you know you need to make, some step you need to take, some bad habit you know you need to give up, and you are waiting, putting it off, you can know this. The devil is smiling at you tonight because he knows so far his program in your life is working. And if you died tonight, you would die in an unsurrendered, un, unprepared state. And that's why we appeal to, to people, don't put off your salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Tomorrow it might be too late. Nobody knows whether we will be alive, whether you will be alive tomorrow. Don't wait until then to make the decisions. You know the Holy Spirit's leading you to make now. Well, we move on to the end of the thousand years. What happens at the end of the thousand years? We know that during the thousand years, the righteous are all in heaven. The earth is desolate. So moving to the end, what happens at the end of the thousand years? One thing we already saw was that there would be the resurrection of damnation. Reading again, Revelation 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead, that's the wicked, Live not again until the thousand years were finished. So at the end of the thousand years is going to be this resurrection for the wicked, the second resurrection. In fact, the Bible tells us in Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That happened at the beginning of the thousand years. On such the second death hath no power. Somebody's going to die the second death. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So someone is going to experience a second death. Before anyone can experience a second death, they have to have what? A second life. Before they can die a second death, they have to have a second life. And so the wicked, they have to be resurrected before they ex can experience the second death. Those that come up in the first resurrection, they are not going to experience the second death. But the wicked, they will. They'll be resurrected at the end of the thousand years, and then they will experience the second death. Let's read now the next verse. The next verse in Revelation 20 is verse 7, which says, 
And when the thousand years are expired, when they're finished, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Well, tell me, what looses him? What releases him? What bound him? There was nobody to tempt. So what looses him then? What looses Satan is the resurrection of damnation. At the end of the thousand years, the second resurrection takes place, the resurrection of the wicked. And when the wicked are resurrected, that looses the devil because now he has someone to tempt, somebody to work upon. And what's he do? He goes right back to work. Verse 8 says, And shall go out, this is the devil, to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. The Bible says he shall deceive the nations. You say, Pastor, aren't they already deceived? Well, the devil, in his true character, he's not going to present himself as the devil. He's not going to appear to the wicked as a a red monster with a pitchfork and a tail and say, all right, folks, you're on my side now. It's <laughs> your tough luck. No doubt the devil is going to present himself as some glorious prince. In fact, he'll probably take the credit for resurrecting the wicked. I, I, I can just imagine that he'll probably do that. And he's going to deceive the nations. The Bible tells us which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. The four quarters of the earth, north, south, east, west. Gog and Magog, by the way, those are expressions denoting those who fought against God. These were tribes that fought against God and God's people. Gog, by the way, is another name for the Antichrist. So Gog and Magog symbolize all those that have opposed God and God's people. This is the wicked. Four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, the number of whom, the Bible says, is as the sand of the sea. Apparently, most of the world will be lost. Not because they could not be saved, but because they would not be saved according to God's plan, which is revealed in God's word. And the Bible tells us, he shall deceive the nations, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. You see, he's going to deceive them into thinking they can conquer this great city. Let's read on. Verse 9 says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed, that means surrounded, the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. What city is this? No earthly city, because all the earthly cities were destroyed by the earthquake 1,000 years earlier. This is no earthly city. This has to be the celestial city. Let's compare Revelation 22, verse 2, 21, verse 2. Revelation 21, verse 2, John says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So apparently, another event that happens at the end of the thousand years, the holy city descends from God out of heaven. And apparently it descends to the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14.4 indicates that. Because the Bible tells us Christ's feet in that day will touch the mount. That's the Mount of Olives. And the mount was split in two. Half goes one way, half goes the other way. And in that spot, sanctified by the feet of Jesus, no doubt that's where the holy city will descend to. And of course, the wicked, as they've been resurrected, they go up and they surround the city to do battle. They think they can conquer this city. We don't know how long they'll prepare for the battle. The Bible says the devil is loose for a little season. We usually think of a season for, you know, about two or three months. We don't know who will be there, but there will be many mighty warriors in that vast army. This, we might call this the final phase of the final battle. The final battle, Armageddon. This is the last phase, if you please, of Armageddon. There'll be people there like Hitler and Alexander the Great and, and Napoleon, Genghis Khan, others. We don't know, of course, but we assume many of those warriors... They went down in death with the ambition to conquer. They're going to come up with the same ambition. And no doubt they will develop some terrible weapons, some great weapons. that Maybe it will look like they will conquer the city. The Bible says they go up and they surround the city to conquer. 
And then what happens? Let's read the rest of verse 9. Revelation 20 verse 9 says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is hell fire. It burns right here on this earth. So at the end of the millennium, Satan and the wicked, they surround the holy city, they attack the holy city, and then the earth is purified by fire. There's only one place of safety on this earth during that flood of fire. That's inside the city. Just as in Noah's day, the only place of safety was inside Noah's ark, so at end time, at the end of the thousand years, the only place of safety will be inside the holy city. Everybody outside is going to be in that flood of fire, destroyed in the flood of fire. The saints inside are not even going to feel the heat. They're going to be safe. This is hell fire. We studied this already. Let's review. We read from Malachi 4 verse 1 where the Bible says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up. They're not going to keep burning. They'll be burned up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And after each one has been rewarded according to their works, we understand the devil, he's going to burn the longest because he's the most evil. Eventually the fire will go out. And then verse 3 tells us, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. So when the fire goes out, the saints will walk out of the New Jerusalem, out of those pearly gates. They'll walk out on those ashes, and they will watch God recreate planet Earth. New heavens and a new earth. And we found out that the devil himself is going to be cremated. God will cremate the devil. Ezekiel 28, 18 and 19, the Bible tells us that. And then God says, never shalt thou be any more. No more devil for all eternity. Let's notice now verse 10. After hellfire has destroyed everything. Well, let's back up and notice verse 10. Some people get confused with verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for forever and ever. Well, how long is that? Do the devil and the wicked have eternal life? No. We found out biblically forever and ever means as long as life shall last. So as long as the wicked have any life left within them, they're going to feel the effects of the fire. But eventually we know the fire is going to go out because the wicked do not have eternal life. And we know that this earth is going to be made new for the home of the saved. So the fire has to go out. We found out that forever means as long as life shall last. The wicked, some of them will be burned up in a moment. Some will burn longer. Each will be rewarded according to their works. And of course, the devil will burn the longest. But eventually, he's going to be turned to ashes too. Let's read now the next verse. We're going to go from, to Revelation 20, 11 to 15, the great white throne judgment now. Here... John is backing up. And you'll find that John does this several times in the book of Revelation. He'll describe events, and then he'll back up and he will add more detail to what has already been described. So here John is backing up, and he's describing what happens before the wicked are punished in hellfire. They experience the great white throne judgment. John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. This would be the wicked dead that had been resurrected. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. No doubt when those books are open, the wicked will be conscious of every one of all of their evil deeds. And they will understand why they are outside the city with the lost. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. 
Death and hell, margin says death and the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. This is the wicked. And the Bible says, and death and hell, margin says death and the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, they were resurrected. Now they're going to experience the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So before hellfire happens, even the wicked have opportunity to see why they are lost. They see all the multitudes of times that God's Spirit worked upon their hearts trying to lead them to decision and where they said no. No, no. They will know they have no excuse. They will recognize it's their own fault that they're lost. In fact, the Bible actually tells us every knee shall bow. Isaiah 45, 23, Romans 14, 11, and Philippians 2, verse 10. So the wicked, they don't repent. But they admit that God is just and fair even in his dealing with them. That their punishment is just. Even the wicked will admit to that. In fact, I imagine even the devil is going to bow down and admit that God is just and fair. They don't repent. After every knee bows, then at least it seems like from Isaiah 9 verse 5, it indicates that they're going to get up and attack one another. They don't attack the city. They recognize that's hopeless. And they're going to turn on one another. And then the fire falls from God out of heaven, destroying the wicked. The whole world will be turned into a sea of flame. Each one will be rewarded according to their works. After the fires of hell in Revelation 20, the very next verse in the Bible says this. Revelation 21 now, verse 1. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. What happened to the first heaven, the first earth? Burned up, destroyed in the fires of hell. Verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow <clears throat> nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. No doubt the righteous looking out of the holy city, they will probably see someone out there among the lost that they know, maybe a friend or family. And no doubt there will be tears even inside the city. But after hellfire has gone out, then God is going to wipe away all of our tears. He'll probably wipe away the painful memory, and then we will experience an eternity of bliss. We know that soon Jesus will come. And when he comes back, it'll be too late then to make your decision, whether you'll be with the saved or whether you'll be with the lost. I want you to come with me for just a moment today into the future. We're going to travel past Christ's coming, past the thousand years, all the way to the other side of the thousand years when everybody will meet. The Bible actually tells us in Revelation 21, verse 11, that the walls of the New Jerusalem are like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. They are like windows, those walls. And I can imagine that's going to be quite a scene for the wicked as they gather up and they look inside the holy city. You're going to be there, friend, either inside looking out or outside looking in, one, one, one place or the other. The saved and the lost are all going to meet one final time around that city. You will be there, either inside or outside. I want you to imagine with me that man we were describing earlier that the devil smiled at. Let's imagine he comes up in the second resurrection, the wrong resurrection. He looks around for his wife and his daughters. He can't find them. All he hears are the curses of the lost. And soon he's caught up with everybody in the preparation for this great battle. And finally the day comes when they march up to that shining wall. And I can see this man as he comes up to that holy city. And he looks inside the beauty of the, out, of the inside compared with the desolation of the outside. 
He sees there inside the beautiful mansions prepared for the saved, the lush vegetation, the landscaping designed by God himself, the golden streets. He sees perhaps the river of life winding down through the city. And maybe in the distance he can see the outshining of God's throne. And he thinks to himself, what a fool I was. What a fool I was that I did not make my decision to be saved. And I can just imagine as that man is looking inside the holy city, perhaps he sees some familiar forms. Perhaps he sees his wife and his three little girls inside the city. And all oh, the memories come back to him. He remembers how his wife urged him to give his heart to the Lord. He remembers the prayers of his little girls. And I can see that man outside the city. He's waving to his family. Hey, hey, I'm out here, honey. Go ask Jesus for a second chance. And his voice just mm, bounces back off that wall. And I can see that man fall in an agony of remorse outside the city, pleading for another chance of salvation, which he'll never have. The Bible tells us there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You're going to be there, friend, either inside the city or outside the city. And I want you for just a moment to imagine yourself standing outside that city. And I want you to ask the question, why? Why am I out here? Why am I with the lost? Why am I not saved? Ask yourself now, is there some decision you've been putting off? Some step you know God wants you to take, maybe some commandment you know God wants you to keep. I know people tell me, Pastor, why do you always talk about that fourth commandment, the Sabbath? And I say, well, the reason why is because the Christian world has thrown away that one. If the Christian world had thrown away the seventh commandment, I would emphasize that one. But the fourth one is the one the Christian world has thrown away. And people say, but if I kept the Sabbath, my family would probably think I had joined some sect. They might laugh at me. <laughs> well, mark this, friends. If you choose to obey the word of God, the law of God, somebody is probably going to laugh at you. Somebody's going to think you're strange. But what good will your family or friends do you if you're outside the city with the lost? I believe there'll be people condemning one another and accusing one another outside the city. They will say, I wanted to obey God and you told me I didn't need to. I wanted to keep the Sabbath and you told me not to. They'll be blaming one another outside that city. Do you suppose people will be blaming their pastors? Will there be pastors outside that city? Oh, yes. Go read the text, Jeremiah 25, 34. The day, the terrible day of retribution for ungodly pastors. People are going to turn in fury on their pastors and say, you led me straight to hell. You're the one that told me God did not care whether I kept all Ten Commandments or not. There will be blood flowing outside that city. People say to me, Pastor, if I kept the Sabbath... I might lose my job and I have to pay bills. Uh, how am I going to pay my bills if I lose my job? If you're outside the city, you could have all the wealth and all the gold of the world. Is it going to help you if you're outside the city? Jesus said, what will, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark 8, 36 and 7. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If you lose your job and gain heaven, what have you lost? <laughs> you haven't lost anything. If you keep your job and lose heaven, what have you gained? You haven't gained anything. If we could only get our priorities straight, Jesus says if we will seek him first, he will provide for us. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen in the future if you've committed your life to Christ. He'll take care of you. My friend, you will be there, either inside or outside. I want to be with the saved, don't you? We're going to give you today the opportunity to make a decision. We invite you to download from our website our little card, decision card. You click on the thousand years 
and you will see their decision. You click on decision, it'll take you right to an online decision card. Revelationsofprophecy.com, look for thousand years, and you can download this right to your computer or your phone. Here are the decisions we invite you to make. First line, I want to be inside the New Jerusalem with Jesus and the saints of all ages at the end of the millennium. There on the online card, you can check that box. If it's your desire, I want to be inside the New Jerusalem with Jesus and the saints of all ages. Put a check mark in that box. Second line, I choose to follow Jesus and keep all of his commandments by his grace. You can check that box right there on the online card. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The third line says, I feel that Jesus wants me to prepare for baptism. If you're thinking about that step, you can check that there on your online card. And God will guide you when and where to take that step. And then the final line, I would like a personal visit to discuss some questions I have. If you'd like a visit, if you're in the area, we can come visit you. If not, we will make arrangements for someone to come visit you and answer your questions. And then be sure to put there on the online card your name, your phone number. There's a place for your email. You can list your address. If you belong to a church, you can list that. And when you're all done, there's a little button at the bottom that says submit. You submit that, it comes right to discovering revelation. We would invite you to make a decision for Jesus. Every decision we make in this world is registered in heaven. And my friend, Jesus wants you to be with him there in eternity. There is hope for you for a thousand years, the devil's bound. There is hope for you, no man on earth will walk around. There is hope for you, the saints above dwell on holy ground. So there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you who inside the holy city dwell. There is hope for you, for the lost outside, all is hell. There is hope for you, the fire will all sinners dispel. But there is still hope in Christ for you. Surrender your life to Jesus and you can be with the saved inside that holy city. We want to end our study today with a prayer. I want to pray for you that God guide you to be among the saved. You can bow your head with us wherever you are. Heavenly Father, thank you for inviting us to surrender all to Jesus. We want to be with the saved inside that holy city. So whatever decisions we need to make, whatever bad habits we need to leave behind, we ask for your presence and power to prepare us to live in that holy, sinless environment we ask your blessing on every viewer and every decision that was made, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We do invite you to download the lesson for this study from our website, revelationsofprophecy.com, and we invite you to tune in again next time. Our next study will be Survival Keys for Revelations End Time. Until next time, God bless you, friend. We'll see you next time.